what the world needs now is love, sweet love. That's the only thing that there's just not enough of. And uh, I, I believe that song is really relevant for this day and time and this hour. Amen. And uh, we, we know, amen, Sister Tanisha, and we know the scripture tells us, uh, Deacon Damon, you, you, we kind of went over this a few weeks ago, that as we enter into these last days, the end of time from the disciples as Jesus, how will we know that we're in the end of times? One of those things that Jesus said was because uh, men's hearts, people's hearts, human beings' hearts, men and women, children's hearts will be will grow cold and they, there won't be any love. There will be a lack of love. So, and you know, he says sin will be rampant everywhere and the love of many will grow cold. That's Matthew chapter 24, verse 12. Sin will be rampant everywhere. And the love of many will what? Grow cold. Now that's what Jesus himself said. That is how one of the signs, one of the things that we know is going to happen when we are at the end of this world. And I believe sin is rampant everywhere. And I believe that the, the, the love of many have grown cold. So this morning, the title of my message uh, is lack of love. What the world needs now is more love. And 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 8 says, Beloved, let us love one another. For love is from God. And whoever loves has been born of God and knows God period. Then he says, anyone who does not love does not know God because God is love. So if you don't, that's, and that's the problem. Many people do not know God. He says, anyone who does not love does not know God. And that is why there's so such a lack of love because people don't know God because to know God is to love because God is love. And he says, we, we are to love one another. And in Colossians, Deacon Damon chapter three, verse 14, uh, we'll see uh, what, what, what Paul was saying in his letter uh, to the Colossians church. And then I'm gonna pick up uh, talking about the Colossians, and I'm going to talk about the Corinthians churches. There was some difference between those two churches, and we're going to talk about uh, what love is and what love is not, and what's and God and Paul was talking to the church when he penned these letters. Listen, when Paul penned these letters to Colossians, to Corinthians, to Philippia, to Ephesians, he was penning these letters from prison. And he was pinning these letters to the believers, to people who have said, I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. He is my King. He is my Lord. I know he paid my sin debt in full. I am a believer in Christ Jesus. This is who he was writing to. Paul was not writing to the world. So I wonder why he had to say some of the things he had to say to the church. Colossians chapter 3, verse 14 reads, and above all these, put on love, which binds together everything in perfect harmony. So he talked about some things above that that I'm not going to read, but you can read them in Colossians chapter 3, verse 14. But he says, above all these things, put on love. Why? Because love binds everything together in perfect harmony. Love binds everything together in perfect harmony. So in Paul's letter to the Colossian, Paul celebrates the new life that believers have in Christ. And he challenges the church of believers in, in Colossians to live according to the newness of that life. So you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. Now I am challenging you as a believer to start living your way, your life in such a way. And in order to do that, what you are going to have to do is put on love. 
Now, what does that mean to put on love? We know what it means to put on our clothes, to put on our shoes, to put on our makeup. That's an action. You have to be doing something. We have to get up in the mornings every day and we have to put love on. But we know love is what? Love is God. And then we're going to talk about what the things love is not. But Paul reminds the Colossians of the supremacy of Jesus. And every Sunday, we read the supremacy of Jesus in Colossians chapter 1. Verse, we start at verse 15 and go through 20. But Paul says in verses 13 through 20, he reminds them of that supremacy of Jesus Christ. And Sister Tanisha just read that. And I'm going to read it again, though, because it's important. It says, you know what, I'll get Sister Tanisha, Tanisha to read it again. Colossians 1, 13 through 20. He has rescued us from the domination of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of his son he loves, in whom he have redem we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Ooh. Yes, Lord. The son is the image of the invisible God the firstborn over all creation. For in him, all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been all created things. For him and for him. He is before all things and in him, all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, and the firstborn among the dead, so that in every excuse me, so that in so that in everything he might have supremacy. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him, and through him to reconcile all, excuse me, I'm so sorry, to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, making peace through his bloodshed on the cross. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Sister Tanisha. So yeah. Paul is talking to the Colossians and he's saying, he's saying, you know, God has delivered us from the dominion of darkness and he transferred us into the kingdom of his beloved son. So the kingdom of darkness is clearly different from the kingdom of, 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 of Jesus. The kingdom of darkness belongs to Satan and the kingdom of light, the kingdom of his beloved son belongs to Jesus. He's, and he says, in whom we have redemption and not just redemption, but the forgiveness of our sins. So because of that, we need to get up and we need to put on love. And of all the believers, new life in, through, through and, in and through Jesus. So Paul saying the believer has died. You have died. You have died. Colossians chapter two, verse 20 says, if with Christ you died to the elemental spirits of the world, why, as if you were still alive in the world, do you submit to regulations? We are not to bow down to this world system. You have died with Christ and he has set you free from the spiritual powers of this world. So why do you keep on following the rules of the world? And then he says, such as, and he lists some of the, some of the things that are such as there. We, we got to do better Christians. And he says, and been buried with Christ. So you, you, ha you have died with Christ and you were buried with Christ. Colossians chapter two, verse 12 says, it says, having been buried with him in baptism in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him, what? From the dead. So it's through baptism, water baptism, that you have been buried with Christ. And then you were raised up through faith and that power that's working in God. So Jesus is the source of the believer's new life. And Paul exhorts those who have believed in Jesus and received this new life uh, to walk in him in the same way they received him in faith. So we walk in him and we put on love through faith. So by faith, Paul is saying we have been saved and by faith, we are built up in Christ. Not only have we died and been buried with Christ, 
but we have also been raised with him. Come on, somebody. So Paul emphasizes that if we have been raised with Christ, we should be focused on Christ. You died with him. You were built up in him. You was buried with him. You was raised with him. So you're all in him. It's all in Christ. You are in Christ Jesus. So you should be able to put on love. Amen. So we ought to keep seeking the things above, Paul says. Seek the things above. Have the mind of Christ. Live as if you were living in and for Christ. Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 1 and 2 says, If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not things on the earth. But what do most of us think about? Well, I, I preached a message uh, a, year, a few years ago that, you know, people say you're too heavenly minded that you're no earthly good. I don't, I don't believe that's possible. I think we're too earthly minded that we're no heavenly good. So we need to make certain that we are putting on love because there is such a lack of love. And so what has to happen is the Christians as a body of Christ, you know, but the, Jesus says that judgment is going to begin at the household of God. He can't judge the world until he judge us. We're going to be judged first. And so what are we doing? You know, and to love, you know, we have to love gently. We have to love truthfully. We have to love the way the word says love. That doesn't mean that you love people you know, to a point where you allow them to do anything they want to do. You love, you love the world. You know, we, we don't love the world or the things of the world. So we can't love people in their sin. We love the person, but we have to separate the two the way Jesus did. So a lot of people, the reason I'm saying this is because a lot of folks says, well, if you love them, you just accept them the way they are. You will accept their lifestyle. You will understand what it is they're doing. You, you, you won't judge them. That's not love. So why all the lack of love among the Christians and in the world? Uh, let's turn to 1 Corinthians and let's look at chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And it says, Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I have become a sounding brass or a clinging cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to, the, to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned, but have not love, it profits me nothing. So here's Paul saying, you can have all these wonderful gifts. And I need to turn there because um, I, I, I want to read verse 5. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 4. So, and then verse 5 says, um, after he gets done saying all these things, he says, love is patient and kind. So this is what love is. Love is, but love is not jealous or boastful or proud or rude. It does not demand its own way. It is not irritable and it keeps no record of being wrong. It does not rejoice above, about injustice, but rejoices whenever the truth wins out. Love never gives up. Love never loses faith is always hopeful and endures through every circumstance. So Paul says, love is the greatest thing of all. Even if you can speak in tongues, even if you speak in all the languages of the earth and of the language of angels, but you don't love other people, it would be like just a noisy gong, a symbol, a clinging symbol. If I had the gift of prophecy and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possess all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains, but I don't have love, he says, you don't have anything. You can have to be able to do any, all those things, but if you don't put on love, 
then you have nothing. And so we need to talk about that. Love is the greatest gift that God gives. And in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we have an elegantly beautiful description of the God type of love. Not worldly love, but the God type of love. It's not hinged on anything. It's just pure. To help us understand all that love entails, the Apostle Paul includes some things that is not love. You know, he says love is not self-seeking. When, and when I say these things, think about the world. Think about the church today. We're in the end times because love has been waxed cold. Also translated as love does not insist on its own way. And the Greek phrase literally means does not seek the things of itself. Love is not selfish. It's not self-focused. You're not thinking about yourself all the time, which is the um, which is the opposite of love, marked by the Corinth church. There were some things happening in that church that Paul had to set straight. This was evidence in the churches that they were divisive regarding leadership. Their attitude toward Paul and their attitude toward legal issues with other Christians, their attitude towards the Lord's Supper. That's why we read chapter 11 every time Every Sunday when we, before we do the uh, Lord's Supper, the Holy Eucharist, we talk, we read, Deacon Damon read chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians because he's talking about their attitude towards that and their attitudes towards spiritual gifts. Paul wanted these believers to stop focusing on their own needs and preferences and serve God and one another and put on love. And that same message is, is to the church today. It hasn't changed. These same things are taking place in the church right now. So the corrective uh, to self-seeking is God-seeking, opposed to seeking our own. And I'm preaching to myself this morning. The remedy for selfishness is love. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second commandment is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love for God and others is the mark of the believer, not love for ourselves. And I know that's a hard thing for us to do, to get outside of ourselves and love others, love God first. And Jesus says, if you love me, there's a way that God, you can just say you love Jesus all you want. But Jesus says, I, I have, I know, I, I have uh, a remedy. I have a test to know whether you love me or not. He says, this is how I know if you love me. You will keep my commands. If you love me, you will do what I tell you to do. That's how I know whether you love me or not. If you're not obeying my commands, if you're not doing what I have instructed you to do, you don't love me. And love is more than uh, words is action and even the bible says that it doesn't matter what you do or what you say or how, it matters what you do not what you say so the corinth the corinthians uh was an evil uh place or, or corinth was an evil place with uh pervasive idol worship and 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 rampant sexual immorality think about that think about that today you could put that church, Corinth church, right here in this country, right today, and there would be no difference in it. And if you read about the Corinthians church, just go to first and second Corinthians and read it, you will see what a mess that church was in. And the recently converted Christians in Corinth sometimes had a hard time shaking off those old habits. They had been doing all those sexual immoral, immoral things. We talked about those things on Wednesday night uh, in Deacon Damon's Bible study. And they had a hard time shaking those bad habits, even though they had, they were, had recently accepted Jesus Christ in their, as their Lord and Savior. They were still struggling with all these sexual immoral things. And that's why he says, such were some of you. You were doing some of these things for Jesus, but now you've been washed. You've been cleansed by the blood of Jesus. So you should no longer be doing those things. 
One man involved in egregious immorality had been tolerated in the church. If you read chapter five, and the Lord's Supper had been dishonored to the point of including gluttony and drunkenness. People had started coming to the Lord's Supper, you know, just to drink wine and get drunk and, and, to, and, to, and eat up all the bread. So to combat these evils, Paul taught that love does not enjoy or delight in those type of actions. Rather, true love finds joy in truth and righteousness. So we are to put on love, which is truth and righteousness. And truth and righteousness stand up for the things of God. Truth and righteousness does not sit on the sideline and let people do whatever it is they want to do. And then say, well, we can't judge them. God has given the believer permission to judge. He says, you will know them by their fruits. Amen, somebody. And wouldn't you rather, wouldn't you rather judge? And I don't mean, that don't mean you're passing judgment, but you're just letting people know, hey, this is not the life that God has. Jesus Christ died for you to have. He died for you to be free, free from what? All these sins and all this corruption. And so that you can have eternal and everlasting life. Would you, wouldn't you rather judge now than for them to be judged by Jesus Christ? And then end up in hell. So 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 4 through 6 contains a list of, of, those, of those things um, that love does not do. Now, the final item in this list is, is that love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in the truth. So you can't be delighting in the things of this world because the things of this, this world is an evil world whether we want to believe it or whether we like it or not. So you can't, so that final thing, we're going to talk about it today, is you do not delight in evil, but you rejoice in the truth. And the truth is not what, your, is not your truth. The truth is not my truth. The truth is the word of God. The truth is Jesus Christ. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So he is the truth. He is the way and he is the life. That's it. So love loves the truth. Love does not delight in unrighteousness and man's truth and man's made up laws. Jesus Christ have already, God has already laid down the law for us. Now we can't go now and change God's laws to fit our lifestyle. Jesus did not die for you to sin. He died so that you will not sin. Come on, somebody. Love does not love evil. It does not rejoice at wrongdoings, is the way the, SC, the ESV Bible puts it. Love does not rejoice in wrongdoings. And so what? So you may say, well, I'm not rejoicing in it. Yeah, but are you doing anything about it? Are you just sitting there idly and not saying anything? So you may not be rejoicing and having a good time uh, in, in wrongdoings and evil, but you're also sitting idly by and not saying anything about it. Come on. I, I know these are hard messages, but God is trying to get us ready for the kingdom. And when I say us, I'm talking about the church. He says, I'm coming back for a church without a spot or a wrinkle. And it's a hard road, a narrow road that we're traveling on. And as we were talking about on Wednesday night, the Bible says only few, only a few are going to get on this narrow road. Only a few are going to make it in. That word few means not that many. And of the millions of professed Christians in this world, how many of those do you think are really on that narrow road that are really going to make it in? So Psalms chapter one, Deacon Damon, if you are there and you can get it, Psalms chapter one, uh, I'm sorry, the first book of Psalms, verses one and two. We, we don't say the use of word chapters for the book of Psalms, but sometimes it's hard for me to 
uh, stray away from that. So Psalms, the, fir the first book of Psalms, uh, verses one and two. Um, so while Deacon Damon is getting that, I'm going to get uh, the, the fifth book of Psalms, verse four, give him time, the fifth book of Psalms, verse, verse four. And here's what it says. You are not a God who delights in wickedness. This is, this is, this is um, David, I believe. You are not a God who delights in wickedness. The God, uh, the God who is love delights in what is true and just. You are not, God doesn't delight in wickedness. He has not, he wants nothing to do with it. Come on, somebody. That's very simple. You are not a God who delights in wickedness. So if you're doing wicked, evil things, unrighteous things, sinning, you, do you think God is taking delight in you? He loves you, but he's not happy with you. It's like you with your children. Are you happy when your children are doing things that they shouldn't be doing? You, are you going to delight in their disobedience? Are you going to like what they're doing? You're not going to like that. You don't approve of it. You love them, but you cannot approve of that lifestyle. God is no different. Amen, somebody. He cannot approve of your lifestyle if it's wicked, if it's sinful. If you're doing the things that he has, he, that he has told us not to do, steal, kill, fornication, cheating, sexual immorality, lying, all those things. God cannot take delight in those things. He's not pleased with your lifestyle. Go ahead, D. Book of Psalms, verses one and two. And it reads, blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the paths of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. So you're gonna be meditating in, in God's law, in his word, day and night. If you want, you know, you're blessed. If you, if you walk not in wickedness or stand in the way of sinners, that meaning, meaning that you're standing around with them, you're agreeing with them, you're doing the same things they're doing, you're sitting in their seats of scoffers, you're, all, you're, just, as, you're just like they are. You, you, you are right in the, in the midst of the center, but you're claiming to be righteous. You're claiming to be a believer, but you're, your lifestyle is the same as theirs. He says, you're not, you can't be blessed doing that. He says, you want to be blessed the blessed man is the person who delights in the law of the Lord and on his laws, who meditates day and night in his word. So the blessed person despises evil, but loves God's truth, reflecting upon it constantly. And it doesn't matter if people say, well, every time I talk to you, you're always bringing up God. Exactly. Exactly. That's, that's where my focus is, is on the word of the Lord. Psalms chapter five, verse four, again says, you are not a God who delights in wickedness. And he's not. In other words, God does not ignore our sin just because he loves us. In fact, it is because of his great love that he provided the means of cleansing us of our sin by giving of himself through his son, Christ Jesus, to die on that cross for us. That is how serious sin is to God that he was willing to step into human form and flesh and die on a cross to pay our sin debt in full. And so now we owe him. We owe him our lives. If you accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you owe him. That's not me saying that, that's word. True love rejoices in what is right and good. Anything that covers up sin or seeks to justify wrongdoing uh, is the polar opposite of godly love. Godly love does not rejoice in uh, wrongdoings. If you're covering up sin, if you're letting it be and you don't have a concern about it and you just 
say, hey, I give up, you know, love doesn't give up. We're going to talk about that. Love does not sweep sin under the rug. Love does not try to find ways to get away with bad behavior. And love does not put up with injustice. Instead, it treasures truth and celebrates good behavior and it promotes virtue. Love, true love has nothing to hide, nothing. True love cannot become cold because it is sustained by Christ who is able to keep us from what? Falling. So we have to put on love. And, there, and you know, and I'm not talking about some fuzzy feeling here, clearly. And love people so much that you can't tolerate their mess. Love them so much that you want to allow them to sweep their sin under the rug. Love them so much that you won't tolerate their bad behavior. You will speak out against it. You will tell them, hey, I think you're drinking too much. You're going to ruin your life. You're going to ruin your liver. You need to put those drugs down. They're not good for you. You need to stop being promiscuous and running around. This woman, that woman, this man, that man. That's not the life God has for you. Quit with all the lies. I know you're lying. Stop. Stop with all the lies. We just, we just got to do better. Well, who am I to tell people what to do? A believer in Christ Jesus? A lover of their souls? Your brother's keeper? Well, they may not want to be around me. They may not like me. They may not. So what? What are you, two or three? Amen, somebody. I can remember when Verlia was a little girl and she'd be playing with some of her friends outside or she'd be at school playing with her friends and then she'd get in the car and the first thing she'd say, she'd have this look on her face. She just looked so distraught. And I'm like, what's wrong? Emily says she's not going to be my friend anymore. Like, Why? Because I wouldn't do what she told me to do. We're not, we're not there anymore. We've matured. Amen, somebody. So further to not delight in evil carries the idea of not gloating over someone else's guilt. It is common for people to rejoice when an enemy is found guilty of a crime they caught in sin. So we don't even want to do that either. We want them to stop the sin. And if they're caught in it, up in it, we don't want to rejoice in it. You know, when pastors get caught, uh, infidelity, doing things they have no business doing, cheating the people out of their money and all that. Yeah, we want them to stop that behavior and Lord forbid they get caught doing it. But even when they do, we don't rejoice over that. We'd be like, well, I hate that he got caught up into that, but he knows better. And, you know, so, you know, but you're not, oh yeah, it's about, you know, we don't do that. This is not, that's not love. Love rejoices in, in the virtue of others not in their vices, not in their wrongdoings. Sin is an occasion for sorrow. When you see people sinning and doing all those ungodly things, and I'm talking about believers, I'm talking about church folk, that is, you are to be still sorry for them and hate that for them and pray for them, not have joy about it. Come on, somebody. You know, I hate that that man is living his life like that. I hate that the pastor, you know, does that to his people, to the church. I hate that this 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 lady is cheating on her husband. You hate I hate that. I don't I don't want her to be living her life like that because what if something happens? You know, if she hasn't doesn't have time to repent or if she doesn't repent or if she goes on living her her life like that, she's going to hell. You cannot die in your sin and think you're going to go to heaven. 
That's why Jesus, one of the first messages Jesus preached was repent. The, he came out the box. His first thing he said when he began his ministry was repent. That was the first word, repent. When he caught, when people were caught up in their sins, the first thing he would say to them is what? You are forgiven. Go and sin what? No more. So basically to exhibit God's kind of love, we must have God's perspective on sin and righteousness. The better we understand love, the more we will, you know, be sorrow over those who commit sin and even ourselves. And it's a godly sorrow. It's a true repentance. I've heard people say, well, as long as I ask for forgiveness, asking for forgiveness is different from repenting. When you repent of something, you turn away from that thing. You're done with it. You're sorrowful about it. You're not going to go back to that anymore. Come on, somebody. You ask for forgiveness when you fall short of the things of God. You repent when you straight up sinning and you turn away from that thing. Thank you, Holy Spirit. So the more we love the truth, the better we can love those around us. For those, uh, for those without the spirit, and we know not everybody have the spirit, you know, not everybody is saved and have Holy Spirit living in them. But if you are saved, if you are a believer, Jesus says Holy Spirit is in you and around you. And we're gonna, I'm going to talk, I'm going to do a whole series on Holy Spirit um, in the fall. So what, what love they have will become colder and colder in the last days. Why? Because they don't have Holy Spirit. The world does not have Holy Spirit. Paul expands this idea in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 and 4, when he describes the last days. Jesus described the last days in Matthew, and Paul describes the last days in 2 Timothy, uh, uh, verses 1 through 4. And here is what he says. Are you guys still with me? Give me a thumb up. You can give me a thumb up in, the, in, in there somewhere in this app. Give me a thumbs up if you're still with me. Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 4 says, but understand this, that in the last days, there will come times of difficulty. For people will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving, good, treacherous, reckless, swollen with conceit, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. Look at that list of things. Lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, None of that is love. None of that fits God's definition of love. So the love those people have is not a warm, living love for God and his truth and his people. Rather, it is the love of self and the love of money, the love of things, the love of ungodly things. Paul describes those whose love for God, Christ, and the saints is only in pretense. It's not reality. Who love that way? They do not, uh, they do all, all those things and still try to live a religious life. And they're doing it from self-love and selfish ends. You, the two does not match. Their aim is to gain glory and applause from men or to use religion to gain something for themselves. And we know pastors and we know people in, in the church and the body of Christ who the whole thing is about them. They've learned how to manipulate the people, how to gain glory, how to, how to applause, you know, how to please men and how to use religion for themselves. Money to buy this and money for that and notoriety and power. That's all it is for them. They do nothing for the glory of God. It's all for the glory of themselves. They do nothing to honor Christ. They're doing everything to honor themselves. They look out for themselves and their future and their children. But nothing is for the good of others. 
you sit quietly long enough, I know you can think of folks that way who are in the body of Christ. So how can we be sure that the love we have for Christ would never grow cold as Christians, I believe, as believers? How can we be sure of that? We begin by examining ourselves to be sure we are truly in the faith. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5, says it this way. Examine yourselves to see whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Or do you not realize this about yourselves, that Jesus Christ is in you, unless indeed you fail to meet the test? Oh, my God. Come on, somebody. Come on, somebody. Examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine, is what Paul is saying. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3. 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 3. I want you to see this for your own self. This is how you test and make certain that your, your love is not waxing cold. Examine yourselves to see if your faith is genuine. Test yourselves. Surely you know that Jesus Christ is among you. Paul says, if not, you have failed the test of genuine faith. And if you know Jesus Christ is in you and with you, there are just certain things that Jesus Christ is with you right now, in your house right now, walking with you every day in the flesh. There is no way you would do some of the things that you find yourself doing now. Because you've got Jesus sitting right here on your side and you'd be, you'd be so scared to go out and do some of the things that you do or say some of the things that you say. Your whole life would change if Jesus Christ were to manifest himself in the flesh and come sit down by you right now. Well, he is there sitting beside you right now in you, dear Holy Spirit. That's how we have to see it. That's how we have to look at it. Come on, somebody. So, you know, um, so if we truly belong to Christ, we can be confident that we possess the love from the spirit that never grows cold. Then we should make every effort to increase our love. Every effort. To love grows. It never stops growing. You never run out. You never reach the top. It just goes on and on and on, deeper and deeper and deeper. And so the Bible says love is not rude. So if it doesn't delight in evil, it's not rude. The Bible says it's not angry. Love then has good manners. If it's not rude, that means it has good manners. Do you have good manners? The Greek uh, phrase could literally be translated, does not act unbecomingly or does not act inappropriately. How are you acting? How are you conducting yourself? Some people, you know, are just as rude as they can be in church. Now, I'm not talking about just in church, but if you're doing it in church, you know, God knows what you're doing outside of the church. You're just as rude and unbecoming and act so inappropriately. Christian love does not seek to cause problems and it does not belittle other people. Christian love involves choosing appropriate actions and responses that help other people. You're not there to make people feel low and bad. To scorn people in front of other people. Rudeness is finding more and more acceptable, uh, uh, an acceptable place in this, in this culture today. People think, you know, I just, man, I told them off and I let them have, you know, that, that's, that, that's satisfying your flesh. You, you're satisfying your flesh when you do that. And trust me, when I tell you, I used to be one of them, tell you off at a drop of a hat and think, didn't want to think twice about it. But rudeness is finding more and more you know, acceptance in, the, in today's world, in, the, in this country. You look at it all on the news. You have the media being rude. You have the administration being rude. You have pastors being rude. Everybody is just rude, rude, rude. People step on your foot now and won't even say, excuse you. Excuse me. They just, 
bump into you, say anything, you know, look at you any type of way. It's, it's just, it's amazing. Public behavior and words that were unthinkable a generation ago, ago are commonplace now. We live in, in, in what uh, Meryl Marco, who, who, who's uh, uh, a journalist for the Wall Street Journal, he says, we're living in a renaissance of rudeness. The fact is that rudeness is rooted in selfishness. Find yourself being rude all the time, it's because you're selfish all the time. Manners are meant to uh, uh, reduce the friction of human uh, interaction. Courtesy reveals a lack of consideration for others. When you're discourteous, you're not considering other people. And that's one of the things you've, we, we've gotten away from teaching our children. You know, I would teach, you know, my daughter, the most important, two of the most important words is please and thank you. Tell folks, thank you. My husband and I was talking about this, you know, this week, people, you do things for people now, they won't even say thank you. You know, and you can say, well, why do you do it for them? Because, you know, if you, if you want thank you, because it's just the right thing. There's, a, there's a, a scripture in the Bible where Jesus healed the 10 lepers and he expected them to come back and say, thank you. But only one came back to say, thank you, Jesus, for healing me. And Jesus says, wait a minute. I thought there were 10 of you. Where are the others? Why aren't they coming back to say, thank you? Don't be rude. Don't be rude. The fact is rudeness is selfishness. It's good to have good manners. Teach your children good manners. The ill-mannered person is communicating that it's all about me. It's all about me. Love, by contrast, cannot be selfish for the simple reason that love is concerned for the other person's well-being. Therefore, love is mannerly. Manner, mannerly. It's not abusive. It has good manners. Amen, somebody. And just because you're married to the person doesn't mean you get to treat them rudely. Just because you've known your friend for years doesn't mean you get to treat her, her rudely. Just because they're your children doesn't mean you get to treat them rudely. I used to be really bad about hanging up the phone on folks. Even my own children, they'd be saying something and I'm, I just click, hang up, they'd be like, hello, hello. You know, that was rude of me to do that. So I'm growing. We all have to grow to this place of where we don't want to do things like that. I'm, I'm just being honest. So when Christians give testimony to what they believe and defend uh, the faith, they are to do so with gentleness and respect. So even when we give testimony about what we believe and, we're de and when we are defending the faith, and I'm going to give you scripture for this, actually go to 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15, we must defend the faith. Yes, we have to defend the faith, defend the word of God, but we want to do it with gentleness and respect. Come on, somebody. So 1 Peter, go there with me. Uh, we're going to be tying up pretty, pretty quickly here. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says, but in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy, always been prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you, yet do it with gentleness and what? Respect. Do it with gentleness and respect. First Peter chapter three, verse 15. It's okay to defend the faith. It's okay to tell people what they're doing. You know what you're doing is wrong. He says, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your hope as if, as, as a believer, always be ready to explain it, but do it with what? Respect, respect and gentleness. Correct your brothers and sisters, but do it respectfully, amen. And even if they don't listen right now, they heard you. In other words, we are to witness in a loving, courteous way. This is not to say that Christians should never speak negatively regarding other people's actions. We have to. The gospel message condemns sin and calls sinners to repentance. 
and faith in Jesus. So we have to condemn sin and we have to ask sinners to repent, but we do it with love and kindness and respect. Come on, somebody. And that recalls, re requires boldness, which is what Holy Spirit is there to do. That's why Jesus told the disciples, stay there, hang out there for a while, don't leave, because you're going to have to have some help. And your helper is Holy Spirit. He's going to come upon you. He's going to give you boldness. And he's going to give you the ability to witness to other people. So Holy Spirit helps you do that. Don't worry about it. He says, don't worry about what you're going to say. Just understand the Holy Spirit is in there. And he will lead you and guide you in your conversation. So the times of Acts chapter 17, verse 30 says, the times of ignorance God overlooked. But now he commands all people everywhere to repent. So there was a time of ignorance when God overlooked some of these things that, that uh, people were doing. But the Bible says, but he commands all people everywhere now to repent. He's no longer overlooking your ignorance. You, have, you cannot plead ignorance of the word of God anymore. Just like you cannot complete, you know, uh, plead ignorance of the law. You can't plead ignorance of the word of God anymore. God is no longer overlooking any of your sins due to ignorance. Come on, somebody. I'm speaking word this morning. Hallelujah. So the gospel message condemns sin. And so uh, must we as Christians and believers. So Christians are called to speak the truth in love. And as we know, love is not rude. Ephesians chapter four, verse 15 says it this way, rather speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. So we have to speak truth in love. Hallelujah, somebody. Speak truth in love and don't be rude. And I'm gonna tell you, uh, you know, a husband who loves his wife or a wife who loves her husband will not treat each other rudely, but with courtesy and respect. A pastor who loves his congregation will not speak to his congregation, congregation rudely and condescendingly, you know, as to, uh, to others and call them out names and talk about them behind their backs and things like that. A Christian who loves his neighbor will remember his manners and act, you know, in, in, with decorum. It's just, it's just the way we have to be, whether we like it or not. A life of love is shown in our words and actions and will impact others to bring glory to the Lord. You can't bring glory to God if you're out there fighting it in the meetings. You can't bring glory to God if you're disrespecting your spouse all the time and saying ungodly things. Your coworkers, you, you know, your family members. You know, I was talking to my 82 year old uncle last night, called me and, you know, he was talking about the family and he said, you know, I'm the oldest one in the family now. All of my mom and her brothers and sisters, they're all gone. And this is my uncle, oldest uncle on my, on my mother's side. And he said, he said, I, all, all, I, all my sisters and brothers are still living and I'm the oldest one of them all. He said, and that's such a blessing. He said, nah, but I just wish we could all get together and just, just have a time together. But he said, it's hard for me and my, for us to even talk. He said, my brothers and sisters, only a couple of them even call me. I have to always call them. And I can hear the sadness in his voice. He said, I don't understand what's going on with families these days. Why can't we just love each other, he says. He says, we can find all kinds of excuses and all kinds of reasons why not to love each other and why not to call each other, but we can't come up with one reason why we should love each other and why we should call each other. And he says, it's very sad. And I said, Uncle Willie James, you are so right. I said, and it's amazing that you bring this up because I'm gonna be talking about that lack of love in church in the morning. And I'm gonna use what you just said. It's true. We can find all kinds of reasons and ways to not love one another, but not one reason why we should love each other. 
And we'll let any little thing cause us to have a family falling out. Well, you're not talking to your brother. You're not talking to your mother. You're not. And I understand those situ there are situations that call for that. But it shouldn't just be every little thing that keeps us separated from our family. We need each other. If love is not, and, and you know, and and I'm and and one other thing I'm going to talk about this morning about love, it is not easily angered. Paul says love is not easily angered. So if you're a person who has a short fuse and you become angry at every little thing all the time, then you're not showing Christian love and godly love. Love is called patience. Both love and patience are listed as fruit of the spirit in Galatians chapter five, verse 22 and 23. And I'll tell you, I'm not the most patient person in the world. I'm not. I, you know, I'm talking about me this morning. I'm, I'm gonna put myself out there because I, I want to be, I want to be, I want to change. I want to, to flow in this love that Jesus is saying we ought to have. So if I'm stepping on your toes, don't worry. I'm stepping on mine too. But this is to make us better and cause us to grow in Christ. Love is called patient in verse four. Both love and patience are listed as fruit of the spirit. Patient includes the ability to tolerate weaknesses in other people without expressing angry, anger all the time. We all have weaknesses. We all have things that we just don't do well. We, we all just trying to get it together so you can't get angry because I'm weaker in certain things than you are help me love covers a multitude of sins the bible says first peter chapter 4 verse 8 says above all keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sin a multitude, that's a, that's, a, that's a huge word. What does that mean? A lot. <laughs> a lot. Love covers a lot of sin. Come on, somebody. It doesn't fly off the handle at every provocation. It covers a lot of sin. Anger itself is not sinful. So I'm not saying you're sinning if you get angry. You're not. But can quickly lead to sin if you're not careful and sinful expressions. So for this reason, Paul wrote to the Ephesians, in your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry, he says. In Ephesians chapter 4, 4 verse 26, how many of us go to bed angry? Uh, uh you look, I'm raising my hand. There are times when we become angry, yet we are called to express our anger in non sinful, constructive ways. Don't let the sun go down on your anger, he says. Get, get over that thing, let it go. Love will guide us in a proper handling of anger. Jesus himself was angry on occasions. We saw how he handled, you know, the temple, beat the people out the temple, turned over the tables, but it was a godly zeal type anger. So there are times when we become angry, but do it in a loving and kind way. Love will guide us to the proper handling of anger. Jesus himself was angry. You know, again, he took, he looked around at them in anger, the Bible says, deeply distressed at their stubborn hearts. And that's in Mark chapter three, verse five. We see it there. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their heart, at their hardness of their heart and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched out and he healed the man. So even though he was angry, he still healed the man. He didn't let that anger stop him from doing what was right in the sight of, in the sight of God. So G Jesus was angry at people's adamant refusal to acknowledge the truth, but he did not sin. In fact, he used the situation for good by healing that man's hand. Come on, somebody. So rather than pretend that we would never feel angry, scripture simply says to be slow to angry, 
to become angry. You're going to become angry, but don't be so quickly to come angry. You know, slow it down. God is slow to anger, abounding in love towards us all the time. Psalms 86, 15 says it this way. But you, O oh Lord, are a God, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. That should be us. That should be us. But you, but you, Tanisha, are a good person, merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Put ourselves in there. That's who we have to be. Just like Christ. Amen, somebody. The truth that God is, uh, is measured in his wrath is immediately followed by the truth that he overflows in love. He measures his wrath. He puts measures on it. He, he, he doesn't let it get out of control, but he puts no measure on his love. He let that love flow. But he contains his anger and he contains his wrath. And we should be the same way. Contain that but let love flow. Always love more than you hate. Always love, 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 love. And I say, when I say hate, I'm just talking about anger and dislike and discontented all the time. Looking, a certain, everything makes you mad and angry. Everywhere you look around, there's enough to do that, but contain that. Amen, somebody, but let love flow. So the connection between the two is obvious. Love puts the brakes on anger, slowing it down for the sake of the of, of love. So let love put brakes on your anger. Break it. Come on, somebody. So being hot tempo, tempered usually involves making snap judgments. You know, so you, you, you decide to do something you, you shouldn't be doing. Next thing you know, you're in some type of big trouble because you didn't get, give yourself time to think and to lo let love prevail. And so you want instant gratification, instant vindication. So you go out and do something you have no business doing in that anger. Slow it down. True love refuses to jump to conclusions and take revenge or hastily judge someone or hastily judge everyone. So don't take revenge. Jesus says, don't do that. He says, vengeance belongs to me. And when you do something like that, then you mess up. The fact that love is not easily angered highlights God's patient love for the world. Uh, he is patient with you. He's in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, says it this way. Let me get that. It says, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise as some count slowness, slowness, but is patient toward you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. He wants you to reach repentance. That's why he's slow to anger. He's patient with you. Why? Because he wants you to repent. Because if you repent, you won't perish. But if you, if you don't repent, you will perish. That first message is repent. Come on now. So you can't be easily angered. So may God grant us a type of love that can keep us from these things. Keep us from being angry, keep us from being rude, keep us from for, for glorying in evilness. You know, allow us to tell people, you know, when they're doing things that they ought not to be doing, but in a godly manner. And this is my prayer, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight. And this is Philippians chapter one, verse nine, verse 11, uh, nine through 11. This is Paul saying, this is my prayer that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so that you may be able to discern what is best and may be pure and blameless for the day of Christ filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Christ, Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. That was Paul's prayer for us. So, and that is my prayer for us this morning that our love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth and insight so that we will not have lack of love as this world enters into the end times. Amen. And so he wants us to be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. And that's in that, in that, in that scripture, filled with the fruit of righteousness 
that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. That's a very strong scripture. So we have to make certain that we are always putting on love, and walking in Christ. And that's the message that we can hear over and over again. Again, what the, what the world needs now is love, sweet love. Come on, somebody. Amen. Thank you.